there's an immense tragedy building here because China has been so successful. It's accomplished what it could not accomplish for a century, which is to become a, a modern, wealthy, powerful country. And Xi Jinping is now threatening to undermine all of that with an absolutely senseless uh, provocation of all, must all the countries around him. The great Orville Shell graces us today with his presence on China Talk. Today, he's the director of the Asia Society Center on U.S.-China Relations, um, and his back catalog uh, changed my life. Um, his book with John Delury, Wealth and Power, I put on my, like, top three books I'd want people to first read to think about understanding modern China. Um, the Tiananmen Papers was an incredibly sort of formative uh, piece of uh, piece of scholarship for understanding how uh, how the system really works. I'm also a huge fan of his document reader series that he put out over the years on on different phases of Chinese history. And uh, Orville's most recently an author of the sweeping 600 page novel telling the story of modern China through the lens of a family who lived through the 20th century uh, PRC. Um, this is like an enormous treat for me, Orville. Thank you so much for coming on China Talk. Well, a treat for me too, Jordan. Thanks. We're in a tricky moment, it seems. Um, Orville, uh, you, you mentioned you've been reading old Lucian darkness quotes. <laughs> Give us one of them and why is that? Well, you know, Lucian really uh, sort of reached the apogee of his writing career as I think the greatest writer of modern China 100 years ago. And he was obsessed with darkness because all around him, he saw darkness and he wasn't sure how China could ever get out of it. And he did not drink the Kool-Aid of Chinese communism. He was a leftist, but he never joined the party and was rather circumspect about it. Um, you know, uh, and, and many people often say to me, well, you're so gloomy. Well, I feel like Lu Xun. And he, he, let me just read one wonderful little quote. And if you aren't uh, enamored of Lu Xun, you should dive back into him because he's one of the few Chinese writers who really understands irony. Anyway, Lu Xun said this uh, called The Power of Darkness. He said, let the awakened man burden himself with the weight of tradition and shoulder up the gate of darkness. Let him give unimpeded passage to the children so that they may rush to the bright, wide open spaces and lead happy lives henceforth as rational human beings. So he was deeply, I think, depressed most of his life, obsessed with darkness, but also obsessed with brightness. And you'll remember, um, I think it was at the end of his wonderful short story, Kuang uh, Energy, the diary of a madman, uh, it ended with Save the Children. As if that was, you know, all that could be done in the period that he was felt himself and China foundering in in the in the, in the teens, twenties, and thirties. So Orville, why why are things so dark today? You know, I think it's a combination of reasons, and it's very hard to sort of to 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 to, to kind of uh, connect or, or or to to separate out what part comes from tradition and what part comes from Leninism. And I think those are the two kind of prevailing dark forces in China. And by way of tradition, I would say, uh, here Lu Xun had it right and also maybe a little bit wrong, that tradition was an enormous weight on China because it prescribed how everything should be done, how people should act and how they should relate to each other. And he felt that that was a source of weakness for China. But then along came Leninism. I think for the Chinese intellectuals of the early 20th century, they saw China's weakness as emanating from its tradition, that its traditional Confucian system sort of had hogtied it and prevented, prevented it from being modern, you know, technologizing itself, adopting new ways as the world was changing. And so they, they attacked it. And, and in fact, there were many wonderful aspects of Chinese tradition, and I think we don't need to go into them here. 
but they, it also was a constraining in a world that was changing so rapidly as China confronted the West. But then into that sort of tradition, remember China had 2,000 years of um, dynastic government, and, and, and it was, it was um, pretty autocratic. Even the Confucian element was embedded in the, the sort of whole legalist theory of a strong, powerful uh, emperor that was confirmed by not divine right of kings, but by the mandate of heaven, which is a cosmic force that conferred legitimacy. So then came Leninism, and it was all about what? Well, how do you build a big, strong, one-party system? How do you organize? How do you unify the country? Because remember, Sun Yat-sen had called China, you know, Ipan Sansha, a dish of loose sand. So these two things came together. And I think they sort of deeply embedded themselves on the genome of China. And so that even during reform, even during the most open-minded party general secretaries of the party, they never could quite escape this sort of toxic cocktail of traditional autocracy and Leninism. And now, just to jump forward here, after a dalliance with reform and a, and a very tempting few decades when we thought maybe China would peacefully evolve into something else, we find Xi Jinping kind of uh, enslaved by these two powerful traditions of autocracy and control uh, and centralized government and um, sort of reverting back to its old, old, most retrograde habits. So that's why Lucian for me is so powerful because he sort of recognized how deeply uh, enthroned these, these, these two elements were in China's tradition and how hard it would be for China to escape uh, and, and become something different. Are there other 19th century or, or pre Kuomintang thinkers or politicians that are other sort of useful reference points to try to understand what's happening with today's China? Well, you know, I, I always loved Hu Shi, who was China's ambassador finally to Washington, went to Columbia to study. I mean, his writing reminds us that there is another side to China the more enlightened side. And of course, Hu Shi was one of the fathers of the quote, Chinese enlightenment, uh, the May 4th movement in 1919 and in the 20s. I mean, and he, he really was very sage, a, a deeply knowledgeable man about Chinese tradition, but also deeply uh, comfortable in the West and the tradition of the enlightenment. And, I mean, he once said a wonderful thing. He said, you know, the only way to have democracy is to have democracy. In other words, you have to experiment with it. It might, might not always succeed, but you can't keep waiting, as China and the Communist Party always says, we're not ready for anything as radical as that. Uh, you know, China's kind of backward and it'll take a long time. But Hu Xi said, no, you, have to, you, you, you only get to some place you want to go by experimenting with it. And there, so there are many other wonderful thinkers, you know, even Mao Zedong, he's, he's a really good read. Uh, I mean, the guy wasn't stupid, and he wrote some very interesting essays, like on contradiction. And uh, I mean, if you want to understand the source of China's maladies today, uh, one could do worse than a little uh, tour of Mao's writing. So, um, you know, in trying to understand the psychology that drove Xi to take China in the direction it's going today. Um, you, you mentioned previously that the scars of the of the Cultural Revolution and, and just Maoist China more broadly are something that folks really need to grapple with to understand that generation's mindset, um, which is something I think you explore really beautifully in um, uh, in your novel Mild Home. I, expand a little bit on that uh, on that theme, Orville. Yeah, you, you know, I wrote this novel Mild Home because I felt that. I don't know how many books I've written, but it's, they're piling up, but they're all nonfiction. And I felt there was something I couldn't quite get at that was at the heart of China's uh, malady, if you can set, put it in such a way, that needed to, could only be got at, gotten at through things like literature, religion, music, you know, and perhaps things like philosophy. 
and I, 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 that's why I turned to fiction. And really what I wanted to do with fiction was to counterpose these two different worlds of the Chinese revolution and Marxism, Leninism, which is all about the outside, rearranging the furniture of the world uh, into revolution with something that I think it, it's really missed and that the West actually has wrestled with uh, through largely through religion. And, and that is, you know, interior life. Confucius was concerned about this. So I wanted to, in a sense, counterpose Mao Zedong with Johann Sebastian Bach. And so that's why I chose a musician as the heroes of my, my novel, because what was Bach all about? He was not about making revolution out there. He was about coming to terms with yourself, your mortality, and your God in here. And I mean, there, there are two absolutely different ways of being in the world. And I think it is the latter that Xi Jinping was deprived of. Now, remember, yes, his father was persecuted. Yes, his father was a veteran revolutionary. And yes, many of us, including myself, hoped that he might end up being a reformer. But he was, he did not turn out to be a reformer. And so we ask ourselves, why? Who is he? What's his fundamental genetic makeup? And I think here's where, you know, even Jiang Zemin went to Russia for a while. Deng Xiaoping went to France, Russia. Zhou Enlai went to France. Many other people went abroad. In other words, they had some um, countervailing uh, influences in their lives that uh, sort of leavened the loaf. But Xi Jinping grew up in China during the formative years, uh, his formative years in the Cultural Revolution. And I think that was the track that got laid down. That was the toolkit he acquired. Um, and he learned how to survive. He was in Shanxi province for a very backward area of China. In fact, in 1975, when I went to China for the first time, and Mao was still alive and the Cultural Revolution was still going, I went up to Shanxi, not far from where he was rusticating as a as a uh, you know educated youth, and but this is he learned how to survive in the Maoist world through control, through manipulation, through tight organization, distrusting people around him. It was a very hostile world, and that's his formative experience. It's not the experience of religion, you know, of forgiveness, of compassion, of love of God, or or even of Buddhist tolerance or any of these things. It was how do you survive in a deeply hostile, deeply fraught world? And that's who he is. That's what he knows how to do. And I think we see him in certain ways acting out the lessons of his that he learned during his formative years about you, one as a human being and as a leader, uh, has to act and has to deport himself in order to survive in this very rough and tumble world of Chinese Communist Party politics. I think uh, Xi Jinping is, a, is a, uh, a creature of the Chinese Communist Revolution. And we thought that when Deng Xiaoping came to power and waved his wand and reform began, the past would sort of vanish. And what we've learned, no, the past lives on in people like Xi Jinping, who came of age and were formed by it. And I, I think this is what makes him so sublimely uncomfortable when he meets with somebody like Obama or Biden or Macron or someone like that in the outside world. He doesn't speak a foreign language. He doesn't really know how to deport himself in this sort of world, this really globalized world outside. Instead, he retreats to formalism, ritual, ceremony, pomp and circumstance. He wants to impress. He doesn't want to hug it out with these guys. And I think this is very much a product of his uh, sort of coming of age of the Maoist era. It's not, it's not just impress, right? It's like prove wrong, overawe. Oh, yes. And of course, this is a very traditional thing too, isn't it, Jordan? I mean, the awe of the forbidden city, the awe, the imperial majesty of the emperor. Uh, and, and, you know, there's the, the whole tradition of that and, and, and uh, you know, the Han Feiza and Guanza and the legalist tradition of leaders never getting too close to the people, never puncturing 
the veil of sort of uh, immortality and infallibility. And I think that's very much uh, she's modus operandi too. But I don't think he's a very, uh, he's a man who's very comfortable uh, in the outside world. Uh, and thus, China is heading back into a much more autarkic uh, kind of a, a, a landscape of us and them. That's where he feels comfortable, uh, not consorting with lead. I mean, Jiang Zemin uh, uh, went on a trip with, with Clinton to, to watch them together. There, Jiang Zemin wanted desperately to be abs absorbable in the outside world, you know, reciting the Gettysburg Address, singing Solo Mio, you know, talking in English. He really wanted to run with the big guys and be out there uh, with, with the global leadership. I think she, she feels very uncomfortable playing that role. And so he's very retracted in China's, in, in, in sort of the Chinese world and wants to draw people into that and doesn't go out abroad well and sort of glad hand and back slap and, you know, and make friends. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, um, uh, you know, he ha he does do retail politics sometimes in China, right? Where he like meets with the delivery driver or like go eats like a Bowser or whatever. But it's always this, it's, he's, it feels like, okay, it's the 21st century. Yes, we have to fill up television every other you know, leader on the world does it. So I guess I should do it too. But the, the interactions are always very uncomfortable to watch. And I think there, there is some, there's some odd stuff going on there where, whenever he's like meeting with the law by seeing. It's very stylized. Uh, it's almost like a play, a scripted play uh, where everything has to go according to the script. And we saw that, of course, in the party Congress where Hu Jintao wandered out. And they had to sort of defenestrate him and nobody quite knew what to do. There was a sweet disorder in the dress, but it didn't kindle in anyone any you know, wantonness. It was just a great big mess. So, yes, she is very scripted. Every meeting with the common people is, is, is scripted. So you've, uh, you've recently said that she believes that China is in a fundamentally hostile relationship with the U.S. and the West. Um, Thinking about sort of contingencies, like, is this, was this inevitable for the sort of Chinese leadership class to convince themselves of this? You know, this notion of there being an antagonistic contradiction, as Mao Zedong would have put it, Didwe uh, Mao Zedong, one that cannot be solved except through struggle or violence is very deep in China's sort of, uh, 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 sort of uh, operating system. That doesn't mean it's the only thing there, but it means that at different times in modern history, the idea of the West is implacable and is only out to engage in regime change, whether through violent uh, war or through what they call peaceful evolution, which is equally as, as toxic for the party. Uh, it's deeply there. And I think in certain times, like Hu Yabang, Zhao Ziyang, even Jiang Zemin, it was relatively uh, sort of latent, but it remained. Uh, and the reform element, the peaceful rise, the let's make friends with the West, let's globalize was more ascendant. But with Xi Jinping, the notion of, uh, of hostile foreign forces has come back to the fore again. And he deeply believes that there's an antagonistic contradiction between us and them, and that we would like to overthrow them. We would like to remove the Chinese Communist Party from the face of the earth. And, you know, in a, in a certain way, he's not wrong. But that doesn't mean we didn't do many decades of engagement and nine U.S. presidents all supported engagement, which was dedicated to trying to slowly work with China not turn them into ourselves or replicas of Republican democracy, but to make them a little bit more soluble in the global world so that we could at least work together. And for a while, it seemed to be hopeful and promising and possibly even successful. But that, I think, was ended uh, by the advent of, of Xi in 2012 and 13 when he came to power. So, I mean, I guess the question then is like, if we're taking as a premise that she believed this, 
as soon as he got into power and it was baked into his worldview. Like did, did whatever happened in the, you know, 2000s and 2010s that led to, you know, who kind of hardening and then the selection of C is that, do you think that was sort of baked in to the, you know, what we talked about at the beginning of the sort of like legacy of, of, of imperial stuff and the, and the Leninism, Leninism that's still in the system or, you know, were there, um, uh, you know, contingencies like around 1989 or even after 1989 that could have played out in a different way? Well, that's, that's question I think lies at the heart of sort of the matter. Um, my own view is that China is a deeply unresolved uh, political culture. It doesn't know which direction it really wants to go in. So it goes in one direction for a while and then another, not so different in many ways from, from other countries that have these, these sort of different political forces at work. I, I think the tragedy was that in 1989, uh, and remember, the 1980s was an extraordinary period in China where, I mean, I lived through the whole thing mostly in, in and out of China, and I, I, I couldn't believe what we were seeing, the, the degree to which the system was flexing. But 1989 ended that. And that was sort of the tragedy, not simply of the massacre, but that the, those tendencies of reform were amputated. But nonetheless, Jiang Zemin brought them back again to some degree. So that by the time uh, you know, he left power, it was relatively hopeful that engagement and, and, and the global compact with China involved might still go forward. And then we got this period of ambiguity under Hu Jintao. You've got him claiming the South China Sea. And remember this idea of core interest, which was stuff that you can't negotiate. And that was the South China Sea, Tibet, Xinjiang, you know, other, other border regions. And that's when things started hardening up. And then along came Xi Jinping and his whole idea of a national rejuvenation and the China dream. Uh, it, it really froze things into a very rigid us and them posture where the forces that had been latent of a hostile West in opposition to China came back with a vengeance. And that was the sad, tragic ending of engagement. And, I, and in my view, whatever successes China has had, which are not inconsiderable and must, must be acknowledged, there's an immense tragedy building here because China has been so successful. It's accomplished what it could not accomplish for a century, which is to become a, a modern, wealthy, powerful country. And Xi Jinping is now threatening to undermine all of that with an absolutely senseless uh, provocation of all, most all the countries around him, it make it very difficult for them to collaborate and for peaceful rise and or peaceful development to become the hour of the day. Instead, we have wolf warrior diplomacy and we have blocks dividing like oil and water. Let's stay on the theme of tragedy for a second. You know, what Greek dramatist most captures what we're currently seeing? Well, you know, um, we spoke earlier about why one turns to fiction. Uh, I, I do think if you want to understand China, you've got to vault out of the world of policy. And because policy presupposes rationality and, and that, uh, that, that there's a reasonable assessment of national interest in a rational way. And I don't think that's what people like Putin and Xi are doing now. I think what they're doing is very much grows out of their own insecure personalities. And both are deeply steeped in victim culture, grievance culture, and in this idea that the world is out to get us, disrespects us, disesteems us. And I think this creates a kind of a psychological syndrome that really needs a little bit of attention to sort of understand how they're making decisions and why they're doing things which I think it's very hard to, to, to view as in the national interest of either of these two countries. And this is why I think China is potentially uh, a bit of a tragedy and why we have to turn to things like Greek tragedy. Because what's Greek tragedy all about? It's about able, smart leaders who have overweening ambition, 
very thin skinned and they 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 go too far you know they the tubers and what's the outcome well and 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 whether it's sophocles or euripides in play after play they bring the whole world down around their shoulders and they too have tragic endings so i think there's a a a, a bit of something there that that you know, the, the Greeks really got the frailty, the fragility of, of human ambition and, and when it gets overboard and, and leaders get too pumped up on the, sort of their national glory, uh, it can lead to very a bad ending. Orville, have you read uh, Julian Gewurz's Never Look Back, China, um, which is basically like a political history of the 1980s? You know, it's just sitting right beside my bed. And I have a couple of other books I have to gnaw through before I get to it. But I know Julian, and I thought, wow, bingo, that's, a, that's, that's right on the money. But, of course, I lived through the 80s. I wrote three, four books about the 80s, and it was an astounding period. And it's a period we do need to go back to look at to remind ourselves that the potentiality of China is not just Xi, uh, Xi Jinpingism that there is a whole other tradition of much more sort of outward reaching uh, openness and uh, a, a kind of a more uh, uh, humanistic and tolerant tradition that grew out of the May, May 4th movement in the early part of the 20th century. So you have to remember when you look at China that what you see is not everything that's there. It's what force is ascendant at the moment in the form of the big leader who is ruling, but that there are these other incipient forces that are much different, much, uh, you know, in contradiction with what Xi Jinping is all about. And they are latent and they are there. And we saw them come out during the, you know, white paper revolution. We've seen them come out again and again and again. I was there for Democracy Wall in 79. I was there for 1989, a million people in Tiananmen Square. And these, 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 these incipient forces are not gone. They're just slumbering. They will reappear when we don't know. That was one of the fascinating lessons of this book is it's like, it, it's, it's almost like the high politics version of that. Like we know so little about what's going on in the heads of every, of like any of the on this stage and um because you know people were really pissed after tiananmen a lot of people moved to the west and leaked their papers and brought their diaries and so we got a little peek into what was going on in the heads of you know huia bang and the other players on the on the stage in that moment and and you have to imagine that um it's not everyone who is a hundred percent on board with where the system is currently headed. No, it isn't. And you know, Jordan, I was not only writing about China and doing all sorts of research on China, I was married to China. My wife was from Beijing. That meant I had the needle right in my arm. I mean, through her, I could see, suddenly it was like being conferred with a set of sort of uh, X-ray vision glasses. Because things that were a little bit obscure to me, just as a as a white guy wandering around China, I speak Chinese, but you know, still there's a kind of an impermeable membrane to get through. Suddenly, I I could get through with ease uh, through her friends, our common friends. So I I'm painfully aware that what Xi Jinping represents is not China. It's an aspect of China, a very powerful aspect of China. But there is an entirely different tradition that gained much uh, momentum during the 20th centuries repeatedly. I mean, even John Kashek and the nationalist government, remember, he had cabinet members, uh, uh, you know, and high officials in the Guomindang government that were Christian, he spoke very good English, French, German. He, he was a real... His government, it was corrupt in many ways and autocratic in certain ways, but it was also very globalized and very comfortable. Remember his wife, Sung Mei Ling, she addressed Congress during World War II in perfect English, went to Wellesley. And Jiang Kai-shek became a Christian himself. And so was Sun Yat-sen. 
even though he was also very traditional. What what role does America and the rest of the world have to play in sort of making sure there's enough reagent for whatever else there is in China? Well, you know, uh, I, I think many of us have been quite critical of China of late, but that should not uh, cloud recognition that I think many of us are also children of engagement. And I think engagement was for America, in many ways, a crowning uh, achievement of diplomacy, where we did keep open-minded. It was a bipartisan effort to bend the metal of Leninism to, 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 to embrace China in the hopes that it could evacuate itself from its very brutal Maoist revolution. And in some extent, it did. So it's a reminder the outside world does have an effect on China. And we, we should keep the door open wherever possible without being simple-minded about it and trusting the party when it's not deserving of trust. But nonetheless, we should remember that it does react to the outside world. And there are forces within it that we could influence for better or worse. So going forward, I, I, I think even as we feel threatened, and we do need to respond to that threat because it's real, we also, if we want to be a truly great power, we have to try wherever we possibly can to remember that things will change. We've never predicted a single big change that's happened in China. It's just sprung forth like Athena out of the head of Zeus. And then afterwards, we look back and say, oh, I understand that. I see where that came from. But nobody prefigured it. And the next big change, I don't know when it will come, but it will come because there are incipient forces within China that are unreconciled and they will continue to contend and evolve. And, and uh, China will continue to be a, an unresolved uh, society and country, I think, for a long, long time. And there will be changes. So that's a that's a beautiful place to end the conversation. But I got you for another half an hour. So we're going to keep going. Um, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a beautiful sentiment and it's also a, a scary one because things can also get a lot worse before yeah. they get better. Um, in your opening to your Republican era reader, um, you have a quote from J. William Fulbright, which presumably he gave before the Korean War started, saying that it is of great importance that we try to learn something more about the strange and fascinating Chinese nation, about its past, its present about the aims of its leaders and the aspirations of its people because we may be heading toward war with each other. And it is essential that we do all we can to prevent that calamity, starting with a concerted effort to understand the Chinese people and its leaders. Reflect on that quote for 2023. Well, you'll remember that J. William Fulbright who was a senator, if you can believe this, from Arkansas, but a very astute and, and uh, a globally minded uh, senator. And uh, he held uh, subsequently some of the most interesting hearings on China in the Senate. As I recall, he was head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I think we need to do that again. Now, we have the Senate Select Committee, the new committee uh, run by Mike Gallagher uh, uh, in the House. And they may do something like that. But I think this is exactly the kind of thing we need to do again, not simply to understand China as an enemy or a hostile uh, 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 you know, force that we may have to oppose, which is important, but also just to understand it. And you remember also that when Fulbright was around, they started the Fulbright Fellowships to try to bridge the gap. They also did, had a, as I recall, a defense... Uh, National Defense Education Act, which gave hundreds of millions of dollars to universities to train people like me to learn Chinese and study Chinese politics and history. I think we need that again. Ambassador Nick Burns, with whom I spoke the other night, was lamenting that uh, there were just under 300,000 uh, Chinese students studying in America, but less than 300 American students studying in China. There's a real deficit there. So I think we're back at that period where Fulbright was alive 
And uh, 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 he recognized that we had to understand China, but we also had to recognize the Chinese threat. But we needed to be able to speak the language. We need, needed to be able to know what was going on. And then they, they did fund people of my generation uh, to go into Chinese studies in all of its various aspects. So we're, we're, we're hitting a lot of inflection points. Um, just a few, just last week, um, CNKI, the sort of like Chinese equivalent of JSTOR, which holds like every Chinese, every mainland social science paper decided that you weren't, oh, you know, no one's allowed to access it from outside the PRC. And this is a, a sort of, a, a, a probably the, um, uh, the most obvious manifestation of the idea that this, the type of research which foreigners were able to do in China over the past, you know, 40 years is coming to an end. So I'm curious, Orville, sort of the, you know, you, you had a, um, uh, um, a longstanding relationship with Franz, with Franz Sherman. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, about him and sort of the, the skills and mindsets that, um, folks need to cultivate to do more of the, you know, watching China from afar, like text-based type, um, uh, type analysis. Yes, the, 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 the incontrovertible fact is that the old world where we could all live in two worlds, back and forth from U.S., Europe, China, Japan, wherever, is over. And that it profoundly affects what journalists can do and what scholars can do by way of being in China and writing stories or, or researching in archives in China. So we've entered a world where, um, you know, we are decoupled in terms of research. And we have to look back, I think, to the period uh, when I first uh, began studying China, where you, my passport said, not good for travel in the People's Republic of China. It just big, bold letters. And I yearned to go to China. Instead, I had to go to Taiwan and I stayed there and a year, year and a half, used to lie on a beach near Jilong at night with my roommates from Taida and listen to a transistor radio and the programs crackling in from the mainland and be very excited by it, but I couldn't go there. But there were some amazing people who, whether they were in Hong Kong or wherever, actually penetrated the veil from afar. Uh, and one of them was uh, Simon Lays, uh, Pierre Rickmans, a Belgian uh, uh, sinologist of immensely, immensely talented man uh, who worked with people like Father Ladani in Hong Kong who were reading provincial newspapers. And uh, Simon Lays actually nailed China better than any of the panda huggers that we're going to allowed to actually go there and look around and have these sort of very uh, stylized tours. And another such person was my mentor with whom I wrote three books, um, Franz Schurman at the University of California here at Berkeley. And he wrote this amazing book called Ideology and Organization in Modern China. And he'd never been to China. But he it was a kind of guy that just could hoover up a language in about six months, you know, whether it was Afghani or Pashto or Japanese or Chinese. And uh, he, he managed to sort of X-ray from afar the Chinese system, both in terms of its structure and its thinking. And that book still stands. So that's a kind of a craft, which we're, I'm afraid, as China becomes more autarkic, more cut off, more isolated, and more neuralgic to the idea of having, China, having foreigners run around within its midst, uh, we're going to have to learn how to do. The sort of Ladanis and Shermans of the world, they, they were able to kind of interact with exiles. And, um, you know, th there, were, there were these really, it wasn't just white guys. Like there were a lot of Chinese people who were sort of supporting them on this kind of quest. And I guess I'm, I'm curious, like, like, what does that mean um, when you don't have places like Hong Kong anymore that are these sort of entrepots? Like, well, yes, you, I mean, we don't have Hong Kong uh, as we used to when it was a British colony. It was sort of free and clear and open and a porthole. We do have Taiwan. And we do have a huge Chinese diaspora outside of China. 
and people coming out every day and more will follow. So it's not as if we're completely cut off. Uh, it's just we can't go there as we used to and just roam around and expect, expect to get a visa easily and have nobody following us and, and have uh, meetings and, and academic conferences and journalistic interviews and one thing or another. That world is gone. So we have to learn how to see what's going on in China through this cloud darkly that uh, was exactly where things were at when I first became interested in China. And I have to say, one of the reasons I was interested in China, because, because I couldn't go there. It was sort of like Lhasa back in the old days. You know, Everybody wanted to go there because they couldn't go there. Uh, so there is a kind of a... a, a uh, you know, a seductive quality to a place that doesn't want you. Uh, but it takes a certain kind of a person to, you know, want to become involved in that kind of a, an affair. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is a different mindset. And, you know, you weren't really a child of engagement, right? But I was. And like, everyone sort of like 20 years younger than you up to my age, like has got into this stuff, probably not because they were fascinated with like how a Leninist regime ticks, but more because they saw all these other potential sort of connection points that that drove them to 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 engage with, um, you know, either the, their country of heritage or something that they wanted to sort of invest an outrageous amount of time learning. What's really interesting, Orville, is like everyone younger than me, like the folks who are still doing it, like knew what they were getting into with um uh, uh with 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 she which is a a a depressing but um uh, f fascinating sort of transition that we'll see playing out over the coming years i think well sort of i'd been to all the stations of the cross i mean i've been shut out from the beginning yearned to get in would wander around cambodia spent two years in indonesia going to the chinese embassy wondering if i could somehow get in i couldn't i finally did in 1975 and then we had that immense pleasure that Julian Gewurz writes about uh, of, in, of the 1980s, when we could imagine China was emerging from this sort of chrysalis of Maoism into something more tolerant, open, just, and involved in the world. That, that created a tremendous amount of optimism and was utterly absorbing. And then as we discussed, 1989 came, and then ultimately Xi Jinping sort of ended that whole promise and set us back into a world that it's, it's not the Maoist world because China is much more wealthy and much more powerful, but it is a world where we're going to be more and more cut off. And I think companies, um, you know, are very foolish if they don't have a plan B for decoupling. We have a, a petri dish example in the Ukraine of what happens when a leader decides they need to, for whatever reason, take a, some territory they believe is somehow theirs. And uh, that, that could easily happen in the Taiwan Straits. And then, you know, things are going to decouple with a vengeance. Whether you have a plan or not, whether you want to or not, whether you, it doesn't matter. It's, then it'll be over. So I, I, this is where the gloomy part of me gets into gear. Um, I think there's a, you know, there is a, a real possibility that could happen. I hope not. And we should do everything to, to prevent it. But this is going to rent the fabric of the world that we knew over the last 20 or 30 years. And it, if it does happen, it will throw us back into an irrevocably divided world that will make the Cold War, I think, look rather, rather like child's play. Um, I'm going to come back to that. But I want to stay with the personal for a second. So you 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 talked about um uh, sort of being on the different stations of the cross and uh, mentioned to me that like just life is easier when you're when you say when you say and write what you think and 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 just try to be sort of like you know be in truth. Um, uh, expand on that point before we get back to World War Three. Well, I think I've lived my whole life, uh, even during the eighties. The question of access of visas for journalists, scholars, and businessmen is absolutely critical because without it, you're dead. If you get excommunicated, it's like being 
you know, uh, ostracized. So the sword of that, that sort of sort of Damocles hung over all of our heads, but it became more and more intense after 1980. And the threat that we could be cut off did condition what we were able to say, write, and even think. And I have to say that uh, one thing about the pandemic, when we couldn't go there, I think it relieved a lot of people of that burden. And I myself, you know, at my age, of course, I'd love to go back to China. My wife's parents still live there, and I haven't seen them since she passed away. I have many, many friends who I haven't seen for a long, long time. But I am ready not to go back. And Chinese love to talk about liberation. And I have to say that as a writer, you know, a, an avocation for which being able to write what you really think is the most elemental and important aspect of your whole existence, to have that kind of liberation, to say what I think and not worry what the Chinese Communist Party is going to, going to, going to, uh, how they'll respond and whether they'll excommunicate me or not, is an immense relief. And it's one of the great reliefs, I think, of growing older, is that you can decide, all right, um, uh, I don't need to worry about my future career. It, it may depend on, on China, but not necessarily being able to go there. Um, all right, I guess we have to come back to Taiwan. Um, why? Why? I think, you know... The reason why Taiwan is so important to Xi Jinping and to certain leaders uh, is that they have a, they're deeply steeped in this victim culture, this idea of having been humiliated and dispossessed of their empire. We see this very clearly in, in Vladimir Putin as well. I mean, Ukraine, in a certain sense, is a kind of a vaguely in his view, should be part of Russia, just like Taiwan. So I think there's a sensitivity to the West having uh, been a predatory force that's dismembered China's empire and the, the urgent need to, to show strength by putting it back together again, even if by force. Uh, it's, it's a bit mutant, but it's powerful. And Xi Jinping has gotten himself really stuck on it. Now, remember that Mao Zedong said to, to Nixon and Kissinger, oh, Taiwan, if it takes 100 years to solve, no problem. And when Deng Xiaoping came to Washington to, to uh, uh, normalize relations between the U.S. and China with Jimmy Carter, he stopped in Japan. And he said essentially the same thing. He said, let's leave the question of Taiwan to smarter future generations. Now, that's the proper way to do it, not push it, not force it, and not attack it if you can't get them to willingly submit to your suzerainty. Uh, I fully believe at some point, if we could just say, if Xi Jinping could say, listen, people, Taiwan is ours. At some point, we'll become more open, more democratic, and we'll become more economically involved with them, and they'll find it in their interest to join us. Let's wait until that time and not push it to, to a, to a blow-up right now. That would be a smart thing to do. Not renounce the claim, but don't push it the way uh, uh, Putin did in, in the Ukraine and blow the world up. And here, I think, is where Greek tragedy helps us understand Xi. He cannot do that because he's a, uh, his ambition is too overweening. His sense of... Uh, any sign of concession evinces weakness, is too repugnant to him. Uh, so we run into a complicated human being who I think is throwing the switch on this in a way that could be catastrophic. Strategic ambiguity, does it make sense still? You know, it's one of those things that doesn't make a lot of sense. And in the Ukraine, you might say, well, why the hell didn't we let, just let him into NATO? Maybe that would have stopped Putin. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> I think, you know, to cancel strategic ambiguity now 
it would be such a provocation and it would it would hit xi jinping exactly at that point of his insecurity and his sort of sense that he is being disrespected and uh, he would take deep umbrage at it and would feel i think he has to respond so i think it's probably best to leave it alone but to arm the hell out of Taiwan as deterrence and really ramp up the porcupine strategy to make China feel that Taiwan is indigestible. And it would be very foolish to attack them. Uh, I think that's the best we can do. There's a, there's a sort of interesting counter argument that some folks are saying with, with, with Putin and, and Ukraine that like, it is a um it is like it it's like impossible for putin to stomach the idea that he could lose to ukraine which is not even you know a people in his mind but um the sort of maybe the off ramp is like look we ended up having to fight nato and like nato's big bad and powerful so like okay i get it we can't really defeat them and so maybe that's like the face saving way out um i mean i guess losing to america is not a face saving or yeah no i mean i i i think they're incapable of of uh saying it, we can't win it doesn't work let's just cut our losses and get out because the matter of face you know nobody's written until recently a a, a book on the question of face in china which is a deeply uh, important element. Uh, some guy, I uh, just got the book, uh, at the University of Hong Kong did just write a book. I haven't read it yet, but this is also to Putin, the face question. So the, the, these kinds of, again, psychological considerations have to be factored into our policy. And I think wherever possible, we don't want to deny she face, but nor do we want to uh, have to engage in the kind of panda hugging that, uh, you know, uh, sort of is, is deceptive and uh, throws us off balance. So I think we really do need to reckon with Taiwan as, as, as something worth supporting, worth defending, both because it has microchips and it is a functioning democracy, but keep the door open, don't violate strategic ambiguity, and wherever possible, seek not to provoke she because he's a poor weak creature and he will respond even if it's against his national interest and brings the world to a cropper um i want to come back to 1989 and the u.s response to that moment well you know i spent the whole spring there watching that demonstration every day going down to the square it was an amazing period i think of all of the things that i've ever the actual historical events that I've actually been able to watch firsthand, this was the most monumental and the most interesting. And um, we all know how it ended. And I think what was so striking for me is that when it did end in the Beijing massacre, the commitment to the United States to somehow continue engagement was so strong in first President Bush that he sent his national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, secretly uh, to Beijing. And he did not even tell Jim, Lim Jim Lilly, his ambassador. It was that secret. And Scowcroft went to see uh, Deng Xiaoping, who was deeply, I think, hurt and wounded by what had happened. And, and uh, a friend of mine, um, uh, David Shambau, uh, uh, recently got the transcript and gave it to me uh, of that meeting with Deng Xiaoping. And the striking thing about it was that instead of Deng Xiaoping begging Scowcroft not to cut China off and not to, not to uh, be completely alienated by the massacre, it was Scowcroft begging Deng Xiaoping not to abandon the, quote, friendship that he said President Bush felt with China and felt with him. And Deng Xiaoping was just uh, just heaping the 
criticism on Scowcroft saying, you caused this, your peaceful evolution, your democracy, you know, uh, uh, agenda was what caused this. And Scowcroft is saying, please, 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 we want to be friends with you. We want to keep the relationship going. And it was very uncertain what the outcome was going to be. What did that say? That said to me that the United States of America went the last measure of devotion to keep this relationship, this of engagement with China, operable. And it, it also suggests that, you know, in a certain sense, as we see now under Xi Jinping, it was China that destroyed engagement, not the United States. Nine presidential administrations on both sides of the aisle supported it. And I, I think that is, that's a bit of a tragedy too. It is an interesting hypothetical if at that moment the um, the sort of consensus around engagement ended up becoming much more of a political debate in the U.S. And to what extent perhaps Beijing leadership may have looked at that and understood what they could potentially be losing out on um, if if the U.S. Uh, really made contingent, uh, you know, put more put put much more aggressive strings attached when it came to domestic Chinese governance on what the U.S. was willing to engage with uh, China uh, economically in the in the 90s and 2000s. I mean, I think that's wrong because I think I think Deng showed and the system showed its cards of where it stood on that stuff, that this was that having the CCP be the preeminent like uh, and sole political voice in China was the thing that mattered more than anything. But curious, maybe Orville like had the if 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 H.W. Bush and Scowcroft and then and then Clinton saw um, China in a different way, um, it, you know, deep really saw China in a different way post 89, how that might have uh, that that timeline might have played out. Well, we might have gotten to where we are now earlier, uh, but they 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 kept a steady course. And, uh, you know, uh, Clinton went to China and got along quite well with Jiang Zemin. And, uh, you know, they we gave them permanent most favored nation status, let them into the WTO in 2001. Uh, I, I think America really did make an extraordinarily good faith effort to keep engagement going. Uh, and uh, it, it did keep going. And I remember being in China in the 1990s and hearing people proclaim peaceful rise, you know, hoping Jay, and that was good, and it could have worked. But that these other incipient tendencies of viewing the West as antagonistic, which came directly out of out of Lenin, you know, his theories of imperialism, there's an insoluble contradiction between the imperialists and the imperialized, the colonialists and the colonialized, on and on and on and on and on. So, uh, I could you say this was destined to happen and we shouldn't have tried? My view is no, we should have tried. We did try. It was a good try. And there were times when it actually might have worked. In the end, it didn't. And we're reverting now to the old model, uh, the retrograde model that uh, Xi Jinping grew up with. And it's very frightening. And it could have catastrophic consequences for the world. So sort of legacies of, of the 80s and, and early 90s, the, the ghost of Chen Yun haunting Xi today, I think, is something that really not a lot of folks have appreciated. It is like shocking to me that there's only one monograph from like 1994 in English about Chen Yun. Um, but uh, how, how do you see the sort of way that he saw the world in terms of, you know, spiritual pollution and, um, you know, the way that the, the market should, you know, the, the state should uh, be influenced in the private sector and just governance in general echoing in, um, uh, in today's China? Well, there have always been these contending forces, uh, you know, more Marxist-Leninist and more sort of uh, open to the outside world in contention within China. And during the 80s, Chen Yun represented the more sort of conservative forces. And then when after 1989, they gained ascendancy again for a while. So it isn't as if Deng Xiaoping, after he waved his wand in 1978 and 79 and started reform, all the, the revolution 
all of the old thinking went away. It went kind of into hibernation in people like Chunyin. And, uh, but it was there and it came back at times when, uh, you know, he could say, see, I told you so, like after 1989. So, and we see this, it's like a barber pole, you know, it just goes around and around and around and there are different mixes of these different forces at different times as, as they wax and they wane. Um, and I think this is the part of China that if we could get some major new study program going, we would want to emphasize that China is a state, uh, is, an, is a state, a society, and a nation in a deeply resolved state of ambiguity. And we, you know, the Americans even are somewhat ambiguous, but at least we have our foundation documents. At least we sort of have a basic compass course. China doesn't. And I don't think the Chinese Communist Party and Leninist theory is going to be ultimately what guides this country forever. And it's going to have to morph and evolve into something else. And it will. Let's close on some book recommendations. What do you think, what do you think folks should be reading nowadays, Orville? Well, you know, one writer I've turned back to just because he nailed it back in the 60s when everybody else was kind of bumping around in the dark, not sure whether to panda hug or, or be anti-communist, was Simon Lays. I mentioned him earlier. And there's a wonderful, wonderful book uh, that uh, a man called Philippe Paquet wrote about him. And I think what is, makes Simon Lay such an extraordinarily uh, important figure is that he didn't allow himself to be blown off course from what he was seeing and discerning and understanding about China past, because he was a deeply knowledgeable uh, classical uh, sort of Chinese scholar, but also the present. And he went to the Belgian embassy right after he wrote China Shadows. Uh, it was in 19, just after the Cultural Revolution began. As the cultural attache, he had to change his name. That's how he got his name, uh, Simon Lays, because he couldn't use Pierre Rickmans because he was going to be in the Belgian embassy and that he had this very anti-communist book coming out. And he wandered around the streets of Beijing and he just looked at what was happening to all the monasteries, temples, historical sites, and he wrote what he saw. And he had it absolutely right. When everyone else was saying, well, we, you know, maybe Mao Zedong has got the answer and, you know, the French Maoists were just out of control. And Simon Lays went on television and radio with them in France and he really, he really gave them a whopping. If they didn't know what the hell they were talking about, you know, Andre Malraux and all of these leftist Italians and French. So read him. If you want to see someone who is not distorted in his thinking by whatever forces or access or business or other interests they may have, read Simon Lays. There's a beautiful uh, essay collection that was published about a decade ago called Hall of Uselessness. Um, yeah. and it's just, you know, I love these like Renaissance guys. I mean, he's writing about Victor Hugo. He's writing about classic Chinese classical poetry. Um, it's just an incredibly, uh, you know, great, like tour through a remarkable mind. And he wrote a novel about Napoleon. Uh, no, listen, I like these people who are, when you read back, he's, he passed away, but you can see they're absolutely true to what they see, and they're not allowing the friendship association or the academic tenure process or whatever to distort what they're seeing and understanding. And I think we need more of that, not posturing, not political, uh, you know, sort of uh, prejudice, but people who see clearly speak honestly, write succinctly, and just say what they see. Okay. More, more books, please. Well, you know, I, I, I can mention books that I found really important. Um, uh, there, there was a book by Dong Su Yu and John Fairbank, which is a collection of translations of Chinese works from the late Qing dynasty, which are really interesting. 
uh, today because because you saw that some of these themes are rather eternal and repetitive about China's neuralgia, about uh, having to deal with the West, accepting the West. Uh, how do you borrow without feeling humiliated or, or, or changing the essence of your own culture and your own belief system? I mean, how do you interface with this very powerful Promethean outside world without becoming a victim? Or without becoming a, a you know a, a, a subservient, so it is a reminder. This book, uh, you know, it's Yang Chi Chao, Kang Yao Wei, all, all kinds of early people writing about this interaction. That China's difficulty in encountering and absorbing and 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 integrating itself in some comfortable way with with the outside world is nothing new. Uh, so it's called China's response to the West. China's response. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the thing is like going through your and other documentary readers. I love like like document collections. But the problem is like the past two decades, man, the writing has gotten a lot worse. It's just it's um, uh, it's 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 really, you know, at least Mao, he was like very dramatic and there's all this craziness. But. But now it's just this like bureaucratism, which is such a bummer to to spend all your all your day reading. Uh, Jordan, my colleague and uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, who's now becoming ambassador to Washington from Australia, had the he got his D fill recently from Oxford by reading all of Xi Jinping's speeches. I don't know how the hell he did it. I mean, that's like eating styrofoam for me. But he actually did it. And extracted from it, I think some, you know, Xi Jinping, it's all there. He said what he's going to do, but it's just incredibly turgid uh, and not very interesting, except if you really want to under, it's like reading corporate reports. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we're back in that world. Where we've got to read this stuff because that's our window. And, and, and if we close that window and we can't go there, we'll be flying blind. So, um, so, so Orville, I'm, I'm, I'm running this right after an interview I did with, with, with Stephen Roach, who also sort of explored some of these, um, uh, like psychological themes about, about the U S and China. I'm curious, you know, what you think he gets right and what you think he may be sort of underappreciated. I think Steve Roach gets right. The fact that we are on very different narratives. I think what he does not get right, because he has largely been treated well, is the lack of reciprocity. And that without reciprocity, you really don't have a game. You don't have a, a dialogue. You don't have anything meaningful. So in, until I think China is willing to reciprocate, uh, I think we're never going to be able to transcend our different dialogues and our different narratives. And, and, and I think that, that that's an important recognition to have, that it is actually has not been the United States, and I've been very critical of our government over my life lifetime, that has prevented that. Now, we may be heading into a territory where Republicans and Democrats both you know, are, are down on China and make that more difficult. But up until now, everybody's been trying to keep the damn door open, even Matt Pottinger said to me all during the Trump administration, the door is open. Please come through. And that takes reciprocity. So that's where I think Steve, um, you know, his, his, his sort of analysis uh, uh, is found a little wanting. Let's close with some recording. Um, I really enjoyed all the Bach in your, in your cultural revolution novel. Um, just for, for some context for folks, the story is there is a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a Chinese man who trained in the West and then ended up moving, uh, you know, was a, was a pianist, ended up moving back to China. And then his kid was a flutist. And of course, you know, they get they get purged and have not a lot of fun. But sort of throughout the whole novel, like we end up coming back to various um, uh, pieces, which you which you very de dexterously pair with um, sort of moments in the in the plot. Um, I'm curious, Orville, I don't know, are there any, are there any sort of recordings that, um, 
um, have really stayed with you over the years? You mean of music? Yeah, Bach, Bach recordings. I mean, listen, we'd be here all night if I started telling you the the. the I mean, I I adore Johann Sebastian Bach, and um, I felt I wanted to take Bach to China, and I tried to do that in this novel because, as I noted, he is sort of the absolute antipode of everything of the Chinese Communist Party is all about. My other great aspiration, Jordan, from a musical perspective. Uh, is to take Beethoven's Fidelio to China, the, his one opera, absolutely gorgeous opera. And what's it all about? It's really a human rights opera about a man who, because he believes in, in, in rights, becomes imprisoned. And his wife dresses up as a man because as names herself Fidelio, you know, faithful. And she goes and she manages to get into the, castle of the evil Don Pizarro where her husband is imprisoned and befriends the jailer and and the jailer's son falls in love with uh, our daughter falls in love with her as a man even though she's a woman gets down into the prison and anyway it's a long and wonderful story um, if I could take Fidelio to China with a few Bach cantatas I would consider my life complete <laughs> 